So I've got my uh, favorite uh, neck warmer here, Shackleton the Explorer. In the last few videos, I've talked about the terrible consequences and uh, climate reasons of the brutal uh, cold spell that's been going on in the U.S. Um, there's still, I just checked, and there's still over 300,000 300, uh, homes without power, so that's probably, you know, about a million people or so. You know, and of course, at the peak of the power outage in Texas, there was something like uh, four and a half million residences. And if you take the average um, family size, you know, three, three people per residence, then uh, three times 4.5 million is uh, 13.5 million people without power. So, you know, it's been uh, a very, very expensive catastrophe, you know, terrible toll on people, you know, right in the middle of a pandemic. So in this video, I'm going to focus on the um, peer-reviewed science papers, scientific uh, understanding that we have on how um, the the uh, jet streams are more meridional and we're getting, you know, troughs, deep troughs, very, very high ridges. And uh, this deep trough has been stuck over the U.S., over North America, and uh, caused these extreme cold temperatures very, very far south. And how, you know, abrupt climate change and the climate system signature is all over this event. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about a paper that was published about a year ago. It's called Divergent Consensuses on Arctic Amplification Influence on Mid-Latitude Severe Winter Weather. So the Arctic warming is, of course, much, much faster than the rest of the planet. And that's causing a decrease in the temperature gradient to the equator or lower latitudes which is then causing the jet streams to slow down and become much wavier. Now, you know, divergent consensus, okay? So the devil's always in the detail, but going back to basic principles, we have to look at why the jet stream exists in the first place. Okay, the jet stream exists in the first place because there's a temperature difference, right? The poles are cold, the equator is warm, that temperature difference causes a pressure difference, and that pressure difference causes a force, a pressure gradient force, which causes the air to move. Now, because the Earth is rotating, you have this Coriolis effect, which uh, rotates things to the, deflects things to the right. Any moving uh, parcel or entity of air or object in the Northern Hemisphere gets deflected to the right because of the uh, Coriolis effect. Okay, so you have the air moving because of the pressure gradient deflected by the Coriolis, and it gets concentrated up in these bands, um, forming the, the jet streams. Okay, so the jet streams exist because of that pressure gradient and the rotation of the Earth. Okay, so as you warm the Arctic greatly, you reduce that pressure gradient. Okay, so you have to change the jet streams. There, there's no other alternative. There's no other option. That's just from first principles. Okay, so we're seeing, we're clearly seeing that, but I'm going to talk about what the science is saying, because this is very relevant to huge numbers of people, right, from, from this um, cold spell. Okay, so, uh, Okay, so I've done two videos here so far. So this is the third video in this series. Um, and I'll be, you know, of course, posting it. It'll be posted uh, shortly after I finish filming it. Um, in Twitter, okay, so, you know, there, I, I showed these diagrams. Here's the dip of the jet stream over North America, strong persistent dip. I showed a movie. Um, this is from Tropical Tidbits of how this is expected to clear out over time, but it's not over yet. Um, and this paper here, um, this is a paper here, um, which um, I'm going to discuss in, in great detail. Um, okay, but first of all, just to remind you, so this is some, some tweets from Zach Labe, and uh, 
a couple of relevant things here. These are the temperature anomalies from month to month. And you can see how, you know, September, October, November is the most severe, you know, and then the winter months are the most severe and less so in the summer in terms of the temperature anomalies. And I want to show you a couple of things. This is the, um, this is the zonal temperature, mean temperature anomaly. So the equator, the North Pole, South Pole, and it goes month to month. So what you can see here is, you know, uh, if you look at these months here, okay, we get tremendous, tremendous um, warming in the Arctic relative to the equator, but it varies a lot from month to month, and it's most significant, you know, in the, um, in the winter months. So just to keep that in mind. Um, in the last video, I showed this image of the deep cold. Okay, this was a tweet from Stefan Ramsdorf. So two competing effects influence our northern winters, global warming and increased polar air outbreaks due to stratospheric polar vortex disturbances. So when the polar vortex is disturbed, cold air spills deep south. Okay, so that's uh, um, in the long run, number one wins, but our winters and our winters are getting warmer. But in the short run, we can get these massive cold outbreaks coming far south. So we're seeing this. So the, the areas of southern Texas experience colder temperatures in parts of Alaska. Okay, tremendous um, uh, latitudinal change in temperature over North America. And here's the, the dip of the jet stream. And there's some cluster analysis in one paper where this is a very cold, in this type of polar vortex states, this so-called cluster four, very, very cold over North America. And another type of cluster that commonly occurs very, very cold over Eurasia, okay? And there's connections from something called causal effect network analysis, which looks at the Eurasia snow cover, the Ural sea level pressure, Siberian sea level pressure, the bear, the um, the uh, the ocean temperature in the Kara Sea, um, and the uh, where is it? The Barents Sea and the Kara Sea. Okay, we're losing sea ice in those regions quicker and year round. And these areas are less warmer, and that warming can set up uh, conditions that distort the jet stream. That propagates then from the jet stream, which is at the troposphere stro stratosphere interface, up into the stratosphere, can break polar vortex with the sudden stratospheric warming, causing a breakup of the polar vortex and all this cold air spilling south over North America and into Europe. Okay, so those are the sort of things that can occur. Um, can occur, okay? So, so uh, the Brent Kara Sea here, the Arctic uh, Oscillation, the, this is heat flux, upward velocity of air up and disturbing the polar vortex. So this study looks at all of the linkages between them, okay, to try to figure out what's, what's happening, what's going on. Okay, so, so this is the key paper. Divergent consensus on Arctic amplification influence on mid-latitude severe winter weather. Okay, so I'll look at the diagram. So what we're seeing is the models, this is the observations from reanalysis, et cetera. So this is, um, this is in winter, December, January, February. These are the, this is the pressures or heights up through the atmosphere. And this is the trend of temperature rise per decade. Um, 0.8 to 1 degree Kelvin or degree Celsius per decade here. So the, the warming is highest near the surface in the Arctic, you know, north of 75 degrees north latitude, and also um, up here where the jet streams are, okay, near the top of the troposphere. So the warming is highest in those two places. The models, um, these are various model and ensembles, and they don't show the observations. They don't, they don't get the observations correct, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. So here's some of the, the things that are going on. So this is in the warm sunlit season. This is in the Arctic summer, okay? So we've got the sun coming in, 
Um, there's a reduction of sea ice and snow cover, so there's an increase of absorbed solar radiation and also ocean heat storage. So the Arctic is warming much, much faster because it's a darker place. There's less sea ice and snow cover, so it's absorbing heat. There's increased ocean heat storage. The downward surface turbulent heat flux is higher because there's less reflected up. We've got these clouds, and these increased clouds reflect solar radiation in the summertime, but they, at night they increase the downward infrared radiation. Okay, you also get ocean heat transport. So these are local effects in orange. In purple, you get the long range effect. You get ocean heat transport into the Arctic. And you also get warm, moist air advecting, moving horizontally into the Arctic by wave propagation from lower latitudes. So whenever we have these strong ridges and troughs, deep troughs, the strong ridges carry heat up into the Arctic. The strong troughs bring heat away from the Arctic. So we're talking all about this uh, massive cold spell over North America, as far down as the Gulf of Mexico. Well, that represents a huge warming of the Arctic, because all that cold air going down over North America is cold air that's being removed from the Arctic and replaced by warmer air. Okay, so the Arctic is warming like crazy, and it's just being manifested in this um, loss of cold air down into deep uh, lower latitudes. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, in the... In the cold, dark season, okay, the ice has grown, but you're still getting, uh, you know, you're still getting, you've got the clouds still. Now it's dark, so the clouds are working 24-7. You know, it's completely dark. There's no sunlight. They're not blocking sunlight, but they're keeping the infrared heat in the system um, in the winter, and that inhibits the sea ice thickening. So the sea ice is not thickening and growing as quickly as it would because of these extra clouds and the extra moisture up in the system. You're still getting ocean heat transport into the Arctic, and you're still getting these the, the jet streams, the Rosby waves, the ridges going deep, high up into the Arctic in the winter. So you get warm, moist air advection into the Arctic by wave propagation from lower atmosphere. And I've talked about the ridges going all the way to the North Pole, bringing the temperatures at the North Pole above zero in the deep darkest parts of the winter okay so these are the effects that are that are going on this is an excellent diagram and uh, this is uh, some of the different uh, locations so temperature anomalies and uh, different types of regional things where we have the Brent Kara Sea much warmer it's therefore warm warm Arctic cold continents warm ocean cold continents sort of thing and other different uh, spatial relationships, but I want to get down to this here, which is key. So this is what the observational studies are showing. Okay, so before we had uh, the the huge Arctic amplification, sort of years ago, we had a cold Arctic and warmer continents. Okay, the cold Arctic, we'd have a strong polar vortex up here, a strong low pressure, mostly zonal flow, the cold air would be confined up to the Arctic. Um, now what's happening is we're getting a much warmer Arctic, and that is that warm air is going up and it's weakening the polar vortex, and then we're getting the cold air spilling out away from the Arctic to lower, lower latitudes. Okay, so as we disrupt the polar vortex, the cold air spills out, and we're seeing you know this type of thing that we have in the US and Texas, also in Europe, okay? So this is what we're seeing. And the models don't actually account for that. The models are, are, haven't figured that out yet. This is what we have with Arctic uh, amplification. The warm air you know, get in the Arctic then spreads out, but we still have a cold polar, vor polar vortex. So here you get more horizontal flow of warm air, and you get the, the, air the warm air coming in from the oceans, et cetera, to heat the Arctic. So the models, um, so keep in mind that the models are showing this sort of thing here, here, and here, and this is what we're actually seeing in the observation. Tremendous warming at the low, um, at, at near the surface, and also up here, disrupting the polar vortex, causing the air to spill out of the Arctic and in, in onto the continent. Now, there's a couple other, uh, so remember, uh, this is just a map showing the Kara Sea and the Brent Sea, where we're losing most of the sea ice in this area is getting huge warming. And this is, these are the connections. Uh, there's, there's a, these papers are referenced by Ramsdorf. And then when there's a weak vortex, 
we're, we're getting longer and longer cold snaps. Okay, thank you for listening.